Uh, thank you all very much for coming along uh, to our session. Uh, the title is Values in Antarctica, Identification and Vulnerability to Anthropogenic Impacts. Uh, my co-convener, Sean Brooks, has um, had to go to bed. <laughs> he, he just uh, flew back from America to Tasmania yesterday and uh, uh, jet lag is, um, uh, he hasn't caught up with his jet lag yet. Uh, so I'll be uh, the convener on this session. So welcome everybody once again. Uh, so I'd just like to make a few intro introductory remarks about values. Uh, uh, an eminent economist said to me once that um, uh, values are the horse that pulls the cart with the data. Uh, or to put it another way around, uh, data are the cart that, that the horse called values pulls. So uh, when we think of things, we often uh, think about, uh, when we think about uh, facts, um, we think about facts in the context of our own values. So I think that's worth uh, bearing in mind. Um, values are, of course, extremely important to us humans, but um, in the 21st century, we don't seem to, to think about them or talk about them very much, um, which I think um, uh, we will try and reverse during this session. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Alejandra Mathia. Um, and Alexandra, uh, uh, you're going to be talking about rereading the environmental protocol uh, subject uh, dear to my heart. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. I'd like to share my screen. I hope it will work. Uh, is that working? Yes, it is. Yes, good. OK, yeah, so thanks for uh, organizing the session. Um, I would like to say something about the context in which the, this paper has been uh, thought through. I'll, I'll be very quick, but it's basically uh, midway between two projects. So I had one project called Political Philosophy Looks to Antarctica, where the idea was to look at how Antarctica can inspire us to rethink some concepts in political philosophy. And on the other hand, there is this other project, Dynamic Territory, uh, uh, as part of a grant from the European Research Council. And there the idea is to rethink territorial rights on the light of uh, climate change, changes in geographic conditions, land use, et cetera, uh, and use of natural resources, and if we should keep calling them natural resources. So this paper, in a way, um, what it aims to do is to uh, say, uh, on the face of increasing criticism to the environmental protocol or so much questioning saying like, is it really effective? Does it really protect Antarctica? Should we just drop it and forget about it? Or maybe should we try to give it a new reading or reinterpreting it in a new light? Um, so the plan is to, well, say some preliminaries very quickly and then go on to the objectives and the environmental principles in the protocol, say something about why I think that there are problems with uh, regarding the fit and interaction. And I take these terms from uh, Oren Young, I'll explain later. And then finally, how I, proposed to reinterpret the environmental protocol. So uh, as you, I'm sure all know, the environmental protocol was signed in 1991, ratified in 1998. It came as a reaction to this convention for mineral uh, prospection and exploitation that was being uh, drafted during 10 years in the, during the 80s. And it was rather uh, a very speedy process for uh, considering how long processes are inside the Antarctic Treaty system. So it was, uh, it came out of four special meetings uh, in 1990 and 91 in Viña del Mar, in Chile, and then Madrid. And today it's ratified by 29, the 29 consultative parties and 14 non-consultative parties. And uh, as Alan Henning says uh, in a piece, the protocol added a new pillar to uh, the Antarctic Treaty, the pillar of environmental protection. So that became really prominent after the protocol was signed and ratified. And what is the objective of the protocol? So in article two, it says that the parties commit themselves to the comprehensive protection of the Antarctic environment and dependent and associated ecosystems. And hereby designate Antarctic as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. Uh, I put those letters in red there because first of all, I, I'm interested in what they meant by comprehensive protection or what should be understood by comprehensive protection. 
But also, this expression of the Antarctic environment and dependent on associated ecosystems, it appears, I think it's 14 times in the protocol. So it was not just a coincidence, or it was not that someone was not careful. They were fully aware that this is what they wanted to do. This was the main objective. And I think this is very important considering that the more we know about Antarctica, the more we realize it's related to other systems, well, to the whole world, if we want to, uh, to, um, to extend that. And therefore, how to understand dependent and associated ecosystems is also a relevant part in the interpretation of the protocol. Uh, so how is comprehensive protection understood? And if we read the protocol, it basically limits itself to saying that there is a duty to restrict and regulate human activities in the area. So this is the, 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 the area south of 60 degrees south. It's the same area that the Antarctic Treaty designates um, as part of its, uh, of its realm. And that's it. So basically human activities will be regulated in that, uh, in that space and not further than that. And I was interested when I started reading the, uh, pre the, the prepar preparatory uh, meetings, what arguments the parties gave or why were they interested in signing this protocol? Uh, and I came uh, across three main reasons. So the first and most important is that they see Antarctica as a natural reserve for science. And this is the first time ever that the expression natural reserve appears in an, uh, in an international uh, treaty. Um, they mention intrinsic value. I'll come back to this in the next slide. So someone says Antarctica presents an unsurpassed opportunity for wilderness preservation. There is a value in the preservation of those qualities for their own sake. And this is the classic expression when you want to talk about intrinsic value, that something is valuable for its own sake. Um, and they don't explain much further what they mean by this. And finally, and this is very interesting, they also say that Antarctica could become a threat. Uh, how? Well, any significant changes to the Antarctic environment could have global consequences for atmospheric and oceanic circulation and upon sea levels. So already at, uh, at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, they were aware that Antarctica was a key uh, factor in uh, the functioning of different Earth systems and that one should not mess up with it, therefore, and that the protocol was somehow uh, in charge of protecting Antarctica for this reason, too. Now, moving to the Article 3, to the environmental principles. Uh, so this is where the expression intrinsic value of Antarctica appears. And this is also something that uh, I, uh, I, I'm interested in as a philosopher, obviously. So uh, the article says that the protection of the Antarctic environment and dependence on associated ecosystems and the intrinsic value of Antarctica, blah, 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 it includes instrumental values such as scientific value, uh, aesthetic values, arguably instrumental, they will all be fundamental considerations in the planning and conduct of all activities in the Antarctic Treaty area. So again, it limits the, um, the scope to the Antarctic Treaty area. But this is all that is said about intrinsic value in the whole protocol. And as opposed to other terms like the area, uh, which is defined, intrinsic value is left undefined. So what do they mean by intrinsic value? Uh, first, well, it's not defined as I've just said, but more interestingly, who is Antarctica or what is Antarctica? They just say Antarctica, but what is that? Um, and if we think in philosophy, um, the obvious contrast is between intrinsic value and instrumental value. So if something has instrumental value, it's valuable for something. And when they say that Antarctic is valuable for science, that's exactly what they mean. It has an instrumental value for scientists to go and do research there. But intrinsic value means, well, independent of any instrumental value, it still has some value in itself. That's basically it, at least for, uh, that's a very simple definition in philosophy. But what I find really interesting is that they don't say, well, I mean, they say Antarctica, but who is Antarctica? And this is something that has not been explored enough, I think. So there, some uh, scholars have started or have asked this question. So for example, Alfonso Donoso is a philosopher. Uh, he gives the answer that it's animals. So it's sentient beings uh, in the continent who should be considered as having intrinsic value. 
And therefore we should plan activities and regulate activities so that it's for their benefit and not, uh, and, th and those activities do not harm them. But there are many other possible answers. So one could say, if one takes a more biocentric approach, we, one could say all living beings in the continent have this intrinsic value, uh, whether they are sentient or not. Or one could go for something more ecocentric. So one could say that life systems that support life in the continent, that's what has value. So the whole system is the to be valued for its own sake. Or one could say all natural entities, living or not. So ice shells could have intrinsic value maybe, or maybe not. Um, or the last answer is, well, maybe the continent as such, but what does that mean really? So what kind of entity is a continent? Uh, and what would it mean to say that it has intrinsic value? And I think it's problematic not to be more precise about this because yeah, it gives you all these options and depending which one you pick, the implications are very different for what policies you will uh, pursue. So what does it require to protect the intrinsic value of this thing called Antarctica? Well, again, according to the protocol, they're only thinking of restricting activities within the area. And here is where I come to the problems of fit and interaction. So very briefly, uh, this is a terminology that I took from Oren Young, who has been working on uh, uh, environmental governance and institutions of environmental governance. And Young defines fit as a matter of congruity or incongruity between properties of the relevant ecosystems and attributes of the institutions created to guide human interactions with these biophysical systems. So put simply is, are the measures proposed suited to achieve the desired objectives? And recall that the objective is the protection, not just of Antarctica, but also of dependent and associated ecosystems. So is there fit here between the protocol and, the object, and its objective or not? Uh, and the unfitness can be of various kinds. So it can be about uh, problems of scope regarding space or temporal scope or cascade effects might affect how the institution uh, want, uh, may fulfill its objectives, et cetera. Um, the problem of interaction, uh, meanwhile, refers to how, yeah, as, it's, as the word says, how different institutions interact uh, with each other and how maybe some institution and the measures taken by it can affect positively or negatively some other institution. So why do I think that there is a problem both of, both of fit and interaction in the case of the protocol? So there is at least a problem of spatial fit. So all the measures are taken to protect the area, but obviously I think this is not enough. So just some numbers here. Out of the 10 worst CO2 emitters in the world, seven are consultative parties. Out of the 10 worst emitters of greenhouse gases in the world, seven are consultative parties, and one is a non-consultative party. Uh, the consultative parties together represent 73% of the global CO2 emissions and 63% of global GHGs emissions. Now, what does this mean? Well, Antarctica, as you know, is one of the uh, places that is changing most rapidly due to climate change, and many species will be negatively affected by this. Uh, there is a fear, of course, of um, sea level rise. And if the mission is really to protect Antarctica, well, it's obvious that <laughs> by doing this or by acting in this way beyond Antarctica, the parties are not really protecting the continent as they committed themselves to. Uh, or this is what I would like to discuss or argue at least. And regarding interaction, well, I think there is also a problem between uh, how the environmental protocol interacts with other institutions of uh, environmental governance. So if we think of the IPCC and the meetings of the IPCC, uh, Antarctica has no representation there. So obviously all the parties go there, but they represent the state. They don't represent Antarctica. And Antarctica sometimes gets a mention here and there, but nobody's really committed to protecting the interests of the continent. So two uh, ideas. Well, uh, one is that protecting Antarctica requires acting beyond Antarctica, or so I would argue. And this is not just a problem for the environmental protocol. I think it's a problem for every single institution of environmental governance that we have today, that you cannot really just protect the place. That's not enough because of the interactions. 
Uh, I will not read that long quote, but I, I just put it there because uh, the head of the Dutch delegation uh, in Vinya, when they were, um, they, they had just met for the first time, he, he has, he, he points exactly to this point. He says like, uh, what will really happen in Antarctica uh, will depend on what is decided in other fora. So we can only do a little bit here by protecting the, the area, but it's clearly not enough. So he acknowledges that we, one should look beyond Antarctica if one wants to protect Antarctica. Uh, and the second uh, thing is that protecting Antarctica maybe requires giving it a more direct representation, um, at least in climate change negotiations. So two places to look at. Um, there is now being drafted a declaration for the rights of Antarctica. Uh, it's a group of various people, activists, um, scholars, um, uh, yeah, basically people who see that the environmental protocol is not enough and want to argue for a stronger protection of the continent. Uh, and that's one of the things that appears, that Antarctica should be represented by someone. Uh, not be only indirectly represented as it is today. Uh, uh, Peter Roberts and I wrote an article uh, which was published uh, some time ago called the Antarctic Paradox, where we point exactly to the same problem and ask who should have who should be the representative because that's not an easy question, of course, uh, but it's a question that needs to be asked. We think. Uh, so I think I'll leave it there um, and leave more space for discussion, uh, but. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Uh, thanks very much, Alejandra. That was uh, super interesting. Um, uh, my talk is also on intrinsic value, so uh, we're going to get a double whammy of intrinsic, intrinsic value this evening. Um, uh, we've got time for one quick question. Uh, does anyone have a question? Or you can just drop a question in the chat, and uh, we can discuss that afterwards. I can't see any hands raised. Um, okay, right. Well, we might move on to uh, uh, Stanislav, uh, Stanislav Kukia, who I believe it has a, uh, a pre-recorded presentation. Um, so, could I ask the uh, the technical team, please, to uh, uh, to run it? Great, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Stanislav Zucker. I am a PhD candidate at the Institute of Biochemistry and Biophysics, a Polish Academy of Science. The topic of my presentation is human mediated dispersal of Antarctic invertebrates. Uh, in this presentation, firstly, I will describe why this uh, is an important topic and uh, explain how human mediated dispersal can occur in the Antarctic. I will present an experiment that uh, showed that we can have more than 5,000 invertebrates on our footwear. And what does it mean for us? So uh, why am I telling you about it? Uh, we are facing major climate change, uh, ice-free area, uh, are expanding and uh, climate conditions in the Antarctic are changing. A human activity causing translocation of uh, organisms combined with these uh, all factors could have serious consequences to biodiversity in unique Antarctic ecosystems. Uh, there are now known examples of the introduction of uh, alien plant species in the Antarctic. Uh, the best known uh, is uh, Poa annua. I think we may all be aware that in plants uh, there are dormant propagules called uh, seeds. Uh, they can be transmitted uh, accidentally when, by uh, humans, for example, on clothing or uh, on footwear. Several extensive studies 
uh, have been published on this topic but uh, I am now talking about plants and the subject of, of my presentation is invertebrates um, let's take a look at Antarctic invertebrates uh, this uh, photo was taken at uh, Point Thomas Oasis uh, on um, King George Island and uh, it shows two indigenous uh, crustacean species in natural habitat. The larger one is um, Brandnecta gaini, Antarctic fire shrimp, and uh, this uh, smaller is uh, Copperport uh, Becala popei. Uh, Antarctic uh, freshwater invertebrates uh, appear to be very delicate, but the question is how could humans uh, carry them on their footwear? And uh, the answer uh, is very simple, because uh, uh, just similar like plants, that uh, invertebrates um, associated with aesthetic uh, water bodies uh, produce uh, cysts uh, capable of anhydrobiosis or as in case of rotifers, tardigrades and nematodes uh, mature individuals are capable of anhydrobi anhydrobiosis uh, These uh, dormant forms can be easily translocated passively by wind or by uh, birds and by humans. Uh, knowledge of this uh, phenomenon uh, led us to access how many such invertebrates can be translocated uh, by humans in the Antarctic. Uh, to answer this question we conducted research at the Polish Antarctic Station on King George Island. First, uh, we did a preliminary survey, we checked to see uh, if Antarctic fire shrimp cysts could be found in uh, mud coming from the anteroom. room. We found 10 cysts in uh, 20 kg of sediment from anteroom room of main uh, building of Polish Antarctic Station and uh, 17 on uh, 5 pairs of uh, footwear from field workers. But we wanted to see uh, how many cysts of fire shrimp and other invertebrates uh, humans can carry as they explore bodies of water. We performed the simple experiment. We walked on the bottom of two ponds near Arstovsky station and then we examined the mud sticking on our footwear. Uh, the uh, dry mud was flooded with water and using uh, sugar flotation we separated the uh, invertebrates. We then uh, counted all uh, individuals and uh, cysts. We used uh, elastic open source uh, machine learning tool to improve uh, counting of cysts. Uh, finally, uh, we also uh, checked whether the in individuals um, actually survived their drying and were able uh, to hatch. For this uh, purpose, uh, we incubated the cysts uh, for a period of 15 days and counted the larvae. In total, we collected uh, 13 samples the weight of the largest sample from one pair of footwear was 233,1 grams. This sample uh, contained uh, 5,182 invertebrates. The most uh, abundant in all samples uh, were copper cysts. And uh, this uh, table it shows the average uh, amounts per gram of uh, mud and hatchability, which was 15% uh, for Anostracans, precisely for uh, Brandichnecta gaini, and 2% uh, for a copper pot uh, Becala popei. 
Survival rates for rotifer, star degrades and nematodes uh, were also high in all samples, but the uh, precise percentages have not been quantified. Uh, the result uh, showed that uh, human uh, mediated dispersal of Antarctic invertebrates is possible and uh, this means that uh, when exploring in the Antarctic, humans may unintentionally carry invertebrates along with uh, mud on uh, their footwear um, and uh, is, uh, it is not impossible that we may carry dormant dry but viable forms of invertebrates over a long distance. Uh, this may result in homogenization of Antarctic populations and uh, invasions in other parts of the world. A basic principle uh, that can minimize the risk of human mediated dispersal uh, is um, to wash footwear, clothing and equipment. In our opinion, a good planning and uh, application of open science uh, can reduce human impact of uh, Antarctic uh, ecosystems uh, using uh, available data and sharing our data will help to better plan field studies and we will reduce uh, unnecessary damage uh, to the environment. We also propose to increase awareness of human mediated dispersal among scientists and tourists. And uh, I would like to thank my co-author Katarzyna Fudala and my supervisor Robert Bialik and members of the Antarctic Expeditions. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the conference hosts uh, very much for the opportunity to give this presentation. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Stanislav. Uh, Katerina Fudala, I believe, is um, in the meeting and is available to, uh, to answer any questions. So if you have a question, um, uh, please go ahead. And you're also able to, uh, uh, to drop a question in the chat. Uh, or the Q&A uh, for Katerina to, uh, to respond to. All right. Um, uh, well, I can't see any questions, so we will move on. And uh, uh, the next presenter is Osama, Osama Mustafa, uh, who will be talking about identification of potential candidates for designating Antarctic specially protected areas. Um, Osama, the floor is yours. Um, okay. You now see my screen? You can see my screen now? Okay. 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 Hi, I'm Osama Mustafa uh, from Germany, and I want to tell you about um, our project um, for the identification of candidates for uh, new Antarctic specially protected areas, in short, ASPAS. The nature of the Antarctic continent is protected by the Antarctic Treaty like no other part of the world, but there are still threats to the Antarctic environment. These are in particular um, human use, like uh, fishery or tourism, other kinds of human contact, like uh, scientific or logistic activities. And of course, there's climate change who affects almost everything. To give, um, for this reason, the Antarctic Treaty offers uh, the opportunity to give very valuable areas and even higher uh, protection status. Um, so we have four different uh, yeah, um, classes of 
protected area. So these are the, the marine protected areas, which are the sea and very large. We have the ASPAS, this is what we are talking about in this, um, in this talk. Uh, we have the ASMAS and we have the historic sites and monuments. The ASPAS, which are um, um, this my topic today, are typically applied um, for smaller terrestrial areas. Um, they have to be proposed by uh, Antarctic Treaty parties and designated by the ATCM. Currently, we have 74 ASPAS. Uh, in this map, you can see the, the position of these ASPAS. So you see it's not very even overall in the Antarctic. You have some spots where we have many ASPAS, some where we have none of them. Um, in the last years, we found that the number of designations for new ASPAS um, it was very low. So there was almost no new ASPA between 2015 and 2020. And in the years around this, there was also not much um, movement in the number of, of ASPAS. So therefore, um, there are more and more calls for the designation of more ASPAS and also for a more um, systematic uh, designation to cover uh, the nature of Antarctica more representative. So in these images, you see some concepts um, who should apply it for this, so the Antarctic conservation biogeographic -geogra regions or the environmental domains. So this concept should help to get a more representative um, designation for, of these aspects. And another interesting fact for us was that um, until now, uh, Germany did not uh, designate or help to or took an initiative to designate any of these aspects. So we did not take this resp responsibility. And this was the motivation. So these um, facts, these last facts were the motivation for us to, um, to start uh, this project and to find areas which could be um, appropriate for the designation as an, as an ASPA. The legal frame um, for the designation of ASPAs is given by, by the um, Environment Protocol as Annex 5 of the Antarctic Treaty. So there are ASPAs are defined and the values of which should, could be, which should be uh, protected by an ASPA um, are defined and all the process is described. Um, the first step in the designation of an ASPA is the so-called prior assessment. And the process of this prior assessments um, is um, also very, yes, very strictly defined by, by guidelines that were um, as adopted by the ATCM. And these guidelines help you in, the, in this process of designation or preparation. In our project, um, we used uh, some criteria to find um, appropriate um, sites or areas. So of course, the most important are the values, the values which are defined by the environmental protocol. And these are mainly the environmental values. Um, this is um, the base for the most of the ASPA. So these are biological features or uh, ge geomorphological features. So everything just physical, biological, chemical, and so on. And, but there are also historic values who could be protected by uh, NASPA. And, and this, many people don't know this. Also science is a value to be protected by an ASPA. A little bit difficult in, in, in practice is, are the aesthetic values because um, aesthetic is something very subjective. Uh, it's difficult to, to apply, but yes, it is a value too. And vitalness is something everybody thinks about for Antarctica. It's remote and it's, um, you have absence of, of humans, and, but this is not, not even, not everywhere the same in Antarctica. So vitalness can also be an important value. For us, uh, an interesting fact is that it's not necessary that we have an acute threat um, for an area. The only criteria is the value of, um, if, if the value, if there are enough values in this area. 
For us in the project, the accessibility for the management operation is also uh, an important point because um, if you take the responsibility for an ASPA, you need to do some management, you need to go to the area and this should be possible. If there's, if it's not possible, you cannot do any management. Therefore, accessibility was also important for us. And we looked that we don't have interference with other national and active programs because if there is uh, if there are scientists of, of a near a station um, active and do some work that they know the area much better, so they don't need us for um, um, describing this area as an ASPA. So when we uh, started the project, we looked for the data, of course, first. So we looked for data who describe or who describe significance for birds, seal, and vegetation. We looked um, for ecological, biological, biological, and geomorphological features, peculiarities. We also looked for scientific significance and potential threats. And we looked for data describing um, this, um, these features. And we found um, that if you look for data um, who is available for the whole continent, it's very scarce. So, because you want to, to do it very, very um, um, objective, our search. So we want to look for the whole continent, but there are very few uh, real continent-wide data sets. You see here, the, 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 the most important data set for us was the important bird areas, but um, there are also some other data sets like the areas of ecological uh, significance or historic site and monuments. We found a data set for meteorites, on the human footprint and on tourism, but that's almost everything where you have a complete data set for the whole continent. So that's why um, um, we had to go to look for other sources, and these were um, expert knowledge uh, on the on the on one side. So we asked experienced scientists who know their field very well um, for the important areas. And we did a lot of literature search. I already, already mentioned the important bird areas and I want to go a little bit more deep in this um, because this is a very interesting data set. The important bird areas, as you can see here, these are these uh, green uh, symbols. Um, they cover all the continent and, um, and they show us almost all um, large bird uh, nesting sites. And, these are about 200 in, in North Antarctica. And we not only have this number of, um, of sites, of areas, um, because 200 is very many. Um, we also have an interest, we found an interesting work of uh, Colin Harris, who tried a kind of a ranking of the importance of such, um, of these areas. So he tried to, to rank the sites by its uh, diversity and also by its uh, size, so its importance for the for the total population, and uh, give a, some kind of score for this for the sites. This was very useful for us because so we could find easily the, for instance, ten most important sites and look if they were um, a, a potential candidate um, in our list. So if we would have more ranked data sets like this, this would be very useful to, to prioritize um, uh, potential sites. So after all this process, which was, uh, as, as I mentioned, very much um, influenced by expert knowledge and literature search, we found um, 13 sites, um, which we called the candidate areas or the initial set of candidate areas. Uh, where, in our opinion, um, we think they they could be um, very interesting for um, for being an ASPA. The um, so this is a map of this of these uh, different sites, and for all of these sites, we prepared uh, site profiles um, to get more knowledge, to concentrate more no, more knowledge and um, more insights in this. Additionally, to the expert knowledge and literature information, we did some uh, remote sensing uh, analysis and we looked more deep in the accessibility of this data, uh, of these sites. 
Finally, we filtered um, two sites, which are now our favorites for the um, designation of NASPA. These are the Danger Islands and uh, Otto von Grubau Gebirge. Danger Islands is a, uh, these are is a group of seven islands in the northern tip, northern, northeastern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, which is the, the primary values of having an enormous uh, population of Adelie penguins of Antarctic shade and uh, besides of this a uh, high uh, biodiversity of other bird species. So it's a very important bird site, the Danger Islands. The Otto von Grubergebirge is very different from this. It's in the continent, it's an oasis in the running mountland. It's a high mountain landscape far from sea, but with two very large lakes. The primary values are here, uh, uh, the deep ice covered freshwater lakes with an extreme, extremophile uh, microbial ecosystem, which includes the only known large conical stromatolites in Antarctica, which is something very, uh, very interesting. And, but it, outside of the lakes, it, uh, it has an, a polar desert oasis ecosystem with very sparse vegetation and a very large colony of snow petrels. If you want to have more information about these two sites, you can find them in the poster of my colleagues um, in this, during this conference. Um, with these two sites, we start the prior assessment process um, for these uh, two sites, um, along with these guidelines. Um, um, as we found that um, uh, scientists from the USA are very active in both of the sites, they are uh, they joined us in the in the process, and we developed um, the prior assessment together. And Germany and the USA submitted the the, the prior assessment to the ATCM CAP um, in this year, and uh, the both sites were adopted. Both prior assessments were adopted by the Antarctic Treaty parties. Um, so, as a summary, we identified first certain areas which we think that they are appropriate to be designated as an ASPA, so from a German perspective. Um, we performed a prior assessment for two of these areas together with the USA. These prior assessments were adopted by the CEP. Next step will be the development of management plans. And so as last thing in this talk, I want to give you share some lessons we have learned. So we missed um, continent-wide data sets. So more continent-wide data sets would be very, very helpful um, um, in the designation and we would not um, depend on the expert knowledge and on the location of scientific uh, activities. Uh, rank data sets are difficult to make, but if they exist, they are very useful um, to prioritize the areas. Um, if values are underrepresented, for instance, species which are not covered, for instance, microbes, insects, small species which where we don't have much information, they will also be underrepresented in protection. Large species like the birds, where we have a lot of information, are very good represented in the protected area system. And we found that the accessibility for management options is also a very major constraint for the designation of an ASPA. I thank you for your patience. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Osama. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, does anybody have any questions? We've got a uh, time for, uh, for one question at the moment. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, in fact, two questions in the chat. Um, uh, from uh, Megan Malpass, what benefits does being an ASPA give an area? Um, an ASPA gives the gives the benefit that um, you um, um, concentrate management or ma management activities there. So you can, um, for instance, define zones where um, people go or people go with restrictions. For instance, we have. Um, 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 ASPAS in, in, tourist, in, in, in sites where we have tourists. And so we can define, okay, in this, this part of the area, tourists can go, in the other parts, only scientists can go. So, and also, the, also for, um, if we do some science there, 
um, the, um, the, we go to a different application process to, to go in the area, which is not only a restriction for the, for the scientists, but also gives opportunity to have more coordination between different scientists and scientific users, which very often in other sites um, is not very coordinated. Okay, thank you very much for answering that question. Uh, there's another question from, uh, uh, from Robert uh, Bialik. Um, if you wouldn't mind answering that in the, uh, in the Q&A, uh, because it's time to, uh, to move on to the, uh, uh, the next presentation. And the next presentation uh, is me. Um, intrinsic value in Antarctica. So just hang on while I get my, uh, my presentation up. Thank you very much again, Osama. That was really interesting. Okay, where are we? Here we go. Uh, can I ask somebody just to let me know that you can see that okay? All right. I'll take that as a yes. Um, okay, uh, my name is Rupert Summerson. I'm, uh, I'm the leader of the SCAR Has Action Group on Intrinsic Value in Antarctica. Uh, my co-authors are Alfonso Donoso, who can't be with us, and Yusra Makanse, who I saw in the chat. Uh, so, um, uh, following on essentially from what uh, Alejandro was talking about, we go back to the Madrid Protocol, and uh, uh, which calls for the protection of the intrinsic value of Antarctica, including its wilderness and aesthetic values. Uh, so I take from that three, uh, from this section, Article 3, I take three points, uh, that three things should be protected, the Antarctic environment, and as Alejandro noted, uh, that also includes the dependent and associated ecosystems, uh, the intrinsic value, and the value for scientific research. Uh, so th that means that the intrinsic value, whatever that is to be defined, should be protected and according to the authors of the protocol, uh, wilderness and aesthetic values uh, uh, should be maybe con considered intrinsic values. Um, I don't have time now, but I, uh, my PhD was in the protection of wilderness and aesthetic values. And I'm pretty sure that I can uh, convince you that um, both aesthetic values and wilderness could be considered as intrinsic value. Um, Aesthetic value on the basis of uh, disinterested, disinterestedness and uh, wilderness um, uh, essentially on the basis that it is, is an intrinsic value uh, that I'll come to shortly. Okay, so we talk about values. Uh, let's have a quick uh, recap on what uh, values are. Um, it's a field of study, the axiology, and uh, there are theories of values in many disciplines including psychology, economics, and philosophy. Um, in summary and in brief, uh, uh, I had to be brief because there are a lot of, there's a lot written about this, but a value is, is defined as a good or something, as you might imagine, something to be valued. Uh, values can be and are held by individuals, groups, and societies. Anyone can hold something to be valuable. And of course, uh, there are uh, competing values uh, somebody may feel that uh, something is valuable, while other somebody else may not. Uh, so it is uh, uh, subjective, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll just skip over this briefly because Alejandro has already been through it, um, and we're not actually collaborators. Um, uh, intrinsic value is the value an entity has for its own sake. Uh, i.e. as an end in itself, sometimes called terminal, terminal value, uh, not a means to an end. 
it's commonly contrasted with instrumental value, uh, which is uh, the value something has to another entity, and dollar value is a, uh, uh, an obvious example of that. Uh, there are a number of schools of uh, philosophical thought uh, on intrinsic value. Uh, I guess the three main ones uh, uh, followers of Immanuel Kant, um, uh, Gerard Moore, and, uh, uh, and Deep Ecology. I don't have time to go into any of those, and I don't want to get bogged down. Um, uh, however, intrinsic value is often controversial and complicated by considered considerations of anthropocentrism. Uh, uh, there's been discussion in the literature over the last decade or more about whether um, uh, there is actually any need for intrinsic value and whether instrumental value uh, might do the job for conservation uh, uh, and uh, ecosystem services. Um, um, could be considered uh, uh, as uh, instrumental value. And I should have put an exclamation mark after no. Um, uh, I believe that instrumental intrinsic value um, is uh, an important, has important value in itself. Uh, so um, let's just think a moment about um, intrinsic value. Uh, you know, we talk about intrinsic value, so the valuing of something for its own sake, but who is doing the value? Who is doing the valuing? And almost invariably, it's humans. Um, uh, so hu humans uh, tend to have anthropocentric values, um, things valued for the, for the benefits they provide to humans. Uh, but we are still capable of adopting non-anthropocentric values. Uh, so that while we are performing the valuation, and the valuation is therefore probably subjective, uh, the valuation itself need not be anthropocentric. Um, objective valuation is uh, uh, difficult to, pro to prove. It's been, the, I guess, the, the holy grail of environmental philosophy and no one has really got there yet, and I doubt that they will. But that doesn't mean that uh, subjective value uh, is valueless. And uh, I think it might have been Osama who uh, uh, talked about uh, the, the value of, of, of objective uh, consideration. Uh, subjective uh, consideration can also be valuable. Uh, I don't really have time to go into why I believe that subjective valuation is um, uh, uh, is valid, um, uh, but I will be making the case for it. Um, so, uh, what is intrinsically valuable in Antarctica? Uh, so, what does the the Madrid uh, Protocol mean? Um, well, there's nothing in the pro protocol to suggest that um, anything is more or less intrinsically valuable. Uh, Alejandro uh, talked about uh, uh, biocentrism, um, uh, ecocentrism. Uh, there's nothing to suggest that um, uh, one thing is more intrinsically, be intrinsically valuable than another. However, uh, as she also mentioned, um, the protocol does mandate protection for the Antarctic environment and dependent and associated ecosystems, which gives a clue as to what the authors considered intrinsically valuable. Um, and presumably the species that contribute to ecosystems will be included. Um, uh, just moving on quickly, um, uh, I'm thinking about the methods of protection, and I can sort of pick up on what Osama was talking about here. Uh, the Madrid Protocol offers two methods of protection. Uh, the Environmental Impact Assessment System, uh, as um, detailed in Annex 1, and the Protected Area System, which is uh, detailed in Annex 5 of the Protocol. Um, uh, the environment in the vi Environmental Impact System environmental impact assessment system provides a review mechanism for impacts of proposed operations at two levels. Initial, which is for minor or transitory uh, impact, 
and I know there's been a lot of discussion about what is what constitutes minor or transitory and uh, a comprehensive environmental evaluation. Um, uh, Osawa is unfortunately not completely correct in that uh, uh, co comprehensive environmental evaluations should include consideration of the effects of the proposed activity on the conduct of scientific research and on other existing uses and values. So this is where uh, values come in and we can link back uh, to the um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, all the values that Osama mentioned and include intrinsic value in here. Uh, so guidance is therefore required on what on identifying what these values are, including what intrinsic uh, what intrinsic value is. Uh, so uh, following on from that, um, uh, and thinking about how to provide uh, or how to guide the evaluation of intrinsic value, uh, potential indicators. Now let's think about you know we can think about indicators. Um, so here's just a, a list of uh, half a dozen. Um, so silence, uh, silence is a key characteristic of Antarctica. Is the the title of many books? You know the silent continent. Um, uh, but this is also a feature of wilderness. It's uh, remote from human presence. Um, uh, that's another key characteristic. That's another characteristic of wilderness. Uh, undeveloped and undegraded landscapes, also wilderness. Unafraid wildlife, that's a, a key characteristic. Um, integrity, so avoiding fragmentation. And uh, aesthetic responses, which of course is uh, aesthetic value. Um, uh, so th uh, those are just some indicators, just some thoughts about how we might be able to guide um, uh, where intrinsic value lies. And um, a thought that we've had is that uh, um, scientists are used to, particularly uh, biologists are used to, uh, to uh, having their proposals uh, submitted to an ethics committee. So why not? Um, use an ethics committee to consider uh, proposals that have impact on intrinsic value. Um, intrinsic value is uh, um, comes from the ethics uh, uh, area of philosophy, so it seems entirely reasonable for an ethics committee to review proposals that might have an impact on intrinsic value. Uh, so uh, our next steps. Um, uh, well, of course, we need to uh, to develop uh, guidance further, um, uh, an information paper to uh, uh, to the ATCM, and we need to go via a consultative party, and um, uh, and then possibly, uh, if we can uh, um, persuade a consultative party to to implement some of these steps, then that may uh, stimulate further take uh, uh, through other consultative parties. So there, there are some thoughts on intrinsic value, things that Agaiva is working on. Oops. Um, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, attention and consideration. And if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. Hi, Rupert, I have a question. I don't know if you see me in the... Can you hear me? Ah, uh, you're muted, I think. But... Yes, I can, can you hear me. Yes. Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, that was very interesting. I was curious uh, when you mentioned the idea of having like a, yeah, so like a panel or someone to decide what, uh, how to protect this intrinsic value. I think we go back to the problem of what, who or what has intrinsic value. So I think that your position is yeah. more ecocentric or holistic in a way. That was my impression, but maybe I'm wrong. So could you say a bit more? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I think um, uh, um, 
you know, following, I think you mentioned that Alfonso, Alfonso Donoso's position is uh, that, um, uh, uh, that, that sentient life, and in fact, you know, all, all life has intrinsic value. I mean, you can, you know, it's well recognized that humans have intrinsic value, uh, but you know, if, if humans have intrinsic value, why can't animals have intrinsic value? And you can uh, you know, take the same line of logic and say that all life has intrinsic value and the, uh, uh, the ecosystem that supports it and the landscape that supports it. Uh, so, no, I think it's entirely logical um, that uh, you could consider that the whole of Antarctica has, uh, has an intrinsic value. Okay. Is there time to ask uh, a, a bit further, or do we have time? Yeah, it's, it's just turned yeah. midnight, so go for yes. it. <laughs> um, so, and when you're saying that uh, Antarctica has intrinsic value, do you also want to say that it has rights, or that's not the strategy you would follow? And I'm asking because from the moment you mentioned rights, then you will go back again to the problem, okay, is it individuals who have rights? Is it the system that has rights? Um, yeah. The usual yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Indeed. Um, well, uh, the, these are all things that that, that we're working through and uh, uh, and really benefit from uh, discussion and debate. Um, I probably don't have time now to uh, discuss the um, uh, you know whether and to what extent. All the, the different components of Antarctica have, have rights, um, uh, but it's certainly something that, that's on our agenda to discuss. And I would encourage everybody to, to at least think about it and, um, uh, and yeah, to sort of think further, think beyond you know, the pure instrumental value. Um, you know, the, the value for scientific research is enshrined in the Madrid Protocol. Um, um, uh, but but so is the intrinsic value. So no, let let's let's think about that and talk it through. All right. Um, thank you very much for your question, uh, Alejandra. And um, uh, we now need to move on to our next speaker. Um, oh, this is a uh, uh, another. Um, uh, pre-recorded presentation. So could I ask the um, the IT team to uh, uh, to play uh, Laura Phillips' presentation, please? Thank you. Hello, thanks for your interest in this presentation. My name is Laura Phillips and I'm going to be sharing some recent work which was done with my co-authors Rachel Lee and Stephen Chown, which is looking at improving species-based area protection in Antarctica. So for our work, we focus largely on the biodiversity values on the continent. And so here are some pictures of some of the species that you get down south. So there are the birds and the seals that everyone knows quite well. But the system's also dominated by a range of these tiny little invertebrate species like tardigrades, mites and springtails. And then the flora system is composed largely of lichens and mosses. And there are just two native vascular plant species on the continent. And so we're trying to protect these species from a range of threats which have been ramping up in recent years. Firstly, we have the human footprint on the continent in terms of both scientific activity and tourism. And then we also have threats from invasive species and the threat of climate change. So having a system in place that's going to protect Antarctica's unique biodiversity values well into the future is really vital. The system that's currently in place to protect these values lies in the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty. And Annex 5 describes that the parties, which are just each of the individual countries that have joined the Antarctic Treaty, should identify and establish a series of protected areas within a systematic environmental geographical framework. And these are to be called Antarctic Specially Protected Areas, or ASPAs for short. And I will continue to call them that throughout the remainder of this talk. 
So there are 69 terrestrial aspers currently in place, and these are shown by the blue points on the map to the left there. Each of these protected areas are based on one or more of these nine values for protection. And these range from things like the ecosystem criteria, which aims to capture representative examples of all types of ecosystems on the continent, to things like unusual assemblages of birds or mammals, and then values such as areas with particular scientific interest or geological or aesthetic importance. And although there is this protocol in place to protect each of these values, Antarctica's network of specially protected areas has been repeatedly assessed as being both inadequate and unrepresentative. So this graph here shows, for example, the number of aspers that have been primarily designated for each of the specific values that is below it. And as you can see, there's quite a high degree of variation in how well each of these categories is being represented. And there is one value in particular for which no asper has been designated primarily due to its value, and that is the type locality. So the type locality criterion within the protocol specifies that the type locality or only known habitat of any species within Antarctica should be protected. And the type locality is just the geographical location from which the original specimen was collected and described. And this might seem like a little bit of a strange criterion at first, especially compared to the other values, but it is very important for a couple of reasons. So firstly, the type locality is critical in terms of taxonomy, because these type specimens are used as a point of reference when comparing or describing new species. And it's important that the specimens can be recollected from their original locations if they are ever lost, damaged or destroyed. And so an example of this occurring was the fire at the National Museum of Brazil back in 2018, where thousands of specimens, and that included some original type specimens, were destroyed and essentially lost forever. So protecting the type locality ensures that these specimens will likely be available for recollection if anything like this does occur again. And then the second reason for the type locality's importance is that it is one of the main mechanisms for species-based area protection because it ensures that any species can be protected even if we know little about their habitat or distribution. And this is especially important in an Antarctic context because for a lot of Antarctic species, we really know very little about their wider distribution and habitats. And the type locality might actually be the only known location for that species. But since this criterion has not yet been systematically addressed, we still don't know if this conservation goal set out in the Antarctic Treaty Protocol is being met. So that's basically what we set to find out with our study here. So we wanted to know firstly, what species live in Antarctica? Then what are their type localities? Are their localities currently protected? And what would be required to protect all of the localities? So to do this, we started with a systematic literature search to construct a database of all of the target species within Antarctica. And we focused on terrestrial and lacustrine animals, plants and lichens. Then after we developed this list, we went back to the original species descriptions to find their type localities. And lastly, we classified the localities as being either north or south of 60 degrees south because this is the Antarctic Treaty area, south of 60 degrees south in latitude, and this is where the protocol on environmental protection applies. So firstly, here are just some results looking at the range of species that occur in Antarctica. So there were 1,142 species in total in the groups that we looked at, and these were dominated by lichens, of which there were 470 species, and then mosses was after this, and this was followed by a range of invertebrates like mites, rotifers, tardigrades, and nematodes. And then from these species, there were 386 type localities that fell within the Antarctic Treaty area. And these were also at a high enough resolution that we could include in our analyses. 
So we mapped these 386 localities across the Antarctic continent to work out how many are protected within the current ASPA network and how many are unprotected. And then lastly, for these unprotected localities, we also created some candidate protected areas. So the example in this picture here shows a current specially protected area in green and then the protected type localities are the green points. And then the purple shows the unprotected type localities as the purple points. And then the area is our candidate ASPA around those points. So of the 386 type localities that we included in our analysis, 108 localities are already captured within 41 of the existing protected areas. So that's those green points on the map there. The remaining 278 localities are not captured within the existing Aspen network, and it would take establishing a further 105 new protected areas to capture all of these values. So then what actions can the Antarctic Treaty Parties take in order to protect the type locality values in Antarctica? So first of all, for localities that are already protected within the current network, parties could formally recognise them by including these localities in the relevant ASPA management plans. And this would ensure that their value is being considered when decisions are being made on entry permits and activities that would occur in those areas. Secondly, species occupancy at all of these sites should be confirmed. So since some of these type specimens were collected over 100 years ago, it is important to ensure that they still occur at these locations and in ecologically significant numbers. Then for the localities that are not currently protected by the existing ASPA network, the most straightforward action that the parties could take would be to expand the protected areas network to capture all of these remaining type localities. However, this does present quite a challenge in terms of the increased management burden that it would pose in terms of administering and monitoring these places. Because expanding the network in this way would over double the number of protected areas in the network. And given that the pace of protected area designation in Antarctica has been quite slow over the last decade, this approach probably seems a bit out of reach at this point. So in order to reduce some of this management burden associated with establishing many new protected areas, the Antarctic Treaty Parties could instead focus on prioritising areas with multiple type localities, or they could adopt a systematic conservation planning approach to prioritise areas that also include other values, such as their geological importance or aesthetic values. And this is really in keeping with the systematic environmental geographic framework that was envisioned by the protocol in the first place. And then lastly, the Antarctic Treaty Parties could choose to focus on the only known habitat of a species, which is that second part of the type locality criterion. So since species habitats are often more extensive than a single locality, it would increase the likelihood that they could be captured within a protected areas network without necessarily having to protect every single type locality. However, as I mentioned earlier, there is this difficulty because for most Antarctic species, we really don't have good species distribution data. So this might only be viable for a certain number of species at this point. So just finally, Antarctica is in this unique situation in that the Antarctic Treaty Parties have already made this commitment to protect the type locality of any species on the continent. But to do this effectively, they would need to revise and expand the existing ASPA network. But as there are relatively few species overall compared to biodiversity elsewhere, there is this genuine opportunity here to fulfill these conservation goals set out by the Antarctic Treaty to protect most, if not all, of the species on the Antarctic continent. And species-based area protection is a tool that could be used to achieve this goal. And I'd like to acknowledge the funders of this project. So this research was done as a part of the Australian Research Council funded program, Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. And it was also funded by an Australian Antarctic program grant. And so that brings my presentation to an end. 
Thank you so much for listening and for your attention. And I have included my email at the bottom of this slide here. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me and I'd, I'd love to answer them. Thank you. Um, excellent. Well, um, I'd like to thank Laura uh, for her presentation uh, in her absence. And I did say that if anyone had any questions, um, I would pass them on to her. Uh, but she's given her email address at the bottom there. Uh, so um, if you have any questions on her presentation, then please uh, uh, send her an email. Uh, that comes to the end of uh, our presentations in this session. However, uh, now is the time for, uh, for further questions of the presenters, um, who I think are mostly still here. And... Uh, uh, and we've got th still 37 other participants. Uh, so um, uh, if you have any questions of any of the presenters uh, or anything else relevant, then please go ahead and uh, maybe uh, stick your hand up and uh, we can start some questions. Alejandra, is that your hand up? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Ahead. Yeah, so I had a question for Osama. Well, actually, two questions, uh, if he's still there. So one question is at, uh, in your last slide. Are you there or? Yeah, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In your last slide, you mentioned um, something about um, how the Germans looked at how ASPAS should be defined, or there was something about German, the German view on how ASPAS should be defined. So I was a bit curious about that. I'm wondering, like, do other states define ASPAS differently or they use different criteria or how does this work? Um, uh, no. And the other, the other question is about wilderness values um, and environmental values and why not subsume wilderness values under environmental? Why did you decide to pull them apart? Is this something that is commonly done? Uh, yeah, I was a bit curious about how you split the environmental and the wilderness values. Um, the... Uh, maybe I share the screen with this. Um, yeah. This, you mean uh, this sentence? Uh, um, I can't see the screen. You can see, cannot see the screen. Uh, Okay, you mean I think you, you you mean the sense that we said we identified certain areas um, um, to be designated from the German perspective. This means okay, exactly yes. <laughs> this means that um, we we found certain areas where we and all the people who were in the project agreed that these are good sites for for an ASPA, but. They, we did not make the final prior assessment and bring them to the ATCM that everybody um, shares this perspective we don't know. We think it is, but we, we, we cannot speak for, for, for all the Antarctic Treaty members, um, uh, treaty parties, because we did not finally ask them. So can I can I ask again? I, I, well, Laura is probably not there, but uh, because it's also related to the last presentation. So they also talked about ASPAS, and it seemed that they used slightly different criteria, or they they thought that some other characteristics were relevant to designate an ASPA. So I'm just wondering, is like, yeah, how much agreement is there, or how much negotiation is there to uh, to decide whether something is an ASPA or is not an ASPA? Because it so, seems it's not it, there is not like a list of fixed criteria saying like okay if it fits all these criteria then definitely it's an ASPA but it's more like yeah it depends how you argue for it. Um, so no, it, there there is a list of criteria. So the list I mentioned at the beginning with wilderness aesthetics. So this is your second question. This is is a is a is, is, is given by 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 the Antarctic Treaty and also more 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 defined by this by these guidelines how to describe it. But of course, it is not one plus two or something because it's all very very fuzzy things we have to talk about like 
aesthetic, what is aesthetic, um, or to compare one species with another species is very, very difficult. Yeah? But it is, it is more or less defined, or it's very, very strictly defined what, what are the values. And the values I mentioned in this table are defined by, by the Antarctic Treaty, not by, by us. We just use them in, 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 this, in this project. So. so this between environmental and wilderness is not yours, it's really from the treaty. Yes, yes, exactly. It's it's not ours, but of course, in the interpretation of these values, there is um, some space, of course, because as I told you, it's not, not very sharp in every position. Yeah, maybe I could jump in to talk about wilderness and aesthetic values. Um, uh, there are a number of techniques that you could use to, uh, to, to determine uh, um, wilderness and aesthetic value, they're actually different. Uh, I mean, they're different values, and so, uh, but you could use the same technique, which is uh, what I use, which is uh, uh, surveying a, a representative uh, population uh, of people. That, uh, wilderness and aesthetic values are, are human subjective values. Uh, but one thing which I found in my, uh, in my research was that, uh, how can I put this? Uh, the more people um, uh, liked, pr prefer, the higher the aesthetic value, uh, the, the lower the standard deviation. So the, the more people liked something, the more they agreed with it. Um, and at the other end of the scale, essentially the uglier the feature, um, almost invariably uh, as a result of human activity, uh, the more people agreed, agreed about that. Uh, so. Um, uh, from memory, it's been a while since I uh, thought about this, but um, you don't actually need a huge number of people to um, uh, to conduct such a survey. Uh, from memory, you get enough statistical power with uh, uh, a little over 100 people. Um, uh, wilderness aesthetic value, well, wilderness aesthetic value is, uh, I guess, a little different because, uh, you know, it's a... Um, uh, it's a human value, and it doesn't seem sensible to um, uh, to designate a, an area that has a high aesthetic value. That you're saying that this is a really, really beautiful place, but you're not allowed into it. Uh, so um, you know, your management plan would have to uh, uh, to be able to uh, accommodate that. Uh, so if I can just hold the hold the the, the floor for another thirty seconds. Um, uh, uh, possibly the, the best known locality for aesthetic value in Antarctica, Antarctica is the Le Mer Channel. Um, I think this could uh, uh, be a very interesting test case for um, uh, an area de designated um, uh, as a protected area for its aesthetic value. Um, but you could accommodate the, um, uh, the, the access by um, uh, designating the, the land areas, i.e., you know, the high mountains and you know, cliffs on either side of the uh, uh, of the channel, as your um, uh, uh, protected area, and allow access uh, by sea down the middle. Um, uh, it would just mean that nobody would be allowed to uh, to build a hotel or something on on the shores, which I think would probably be not a bad thing. So those are my thoughts, anyway. <laughs> And uh, I just like also I forgot to to mention that um, um, uh, uh, myself uh, and the other members of uh, the action group on uh, intrinsic value in Antarctica has an e-poster uh, uh, up. So please um, please have a look at it at that when you have a moment. Um, it's in the the e-poster part of the um, uh, of the uh, conference website. Does anyone else have a, an e-poster they'd like to draw attention to? I think I already did uh, mention my our two posters to our related to our project. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Uh, no worries at all. Um, 
Uh, well, do we have any uh, any further questions uh, uh, or comments? All right. Um, uh, well, it's half past midnight here, so um, I think I might, um, uh, if there are no more questions, last chance, I'll draw the session to a close. Uh, thank you all very much for your attendance and participation.